do it in a way that's responsible and climate change and all that's important. But it isn't the only thing. And in fact, I don't even think it's the main thing. I think the main thing is the architecture. Build beautiful homes and they will be durable because people will sustain Take care of them. them. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast, a regular discussion with industry professionals. Today I'm joined by builder Fernando Pajes Ruiz. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast and the original Fine Home Building Podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can leave feedback and ask questions there too. Fernando, it is a pleasure to meet you. It's been well, thank too you long. Very much. Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you too, although you're a familiar face to me. I That's kind of you to say. <laughs> well, I should, you I know, I, too. I've been uh, f- following your uh, editorial work for years and years, and uh, yeah. you, 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 and I recently collaborated on a piece with engineer Jay Crandall on um, the very nuanced control of vapor in building assemblies, and it's mm-hmm. one of the uh, better pieces I think we've done in in recent memory. How do you well, get turned on? It feels like to this? an accomplishment. It feels like an accomplishment. That's why you say it's one of the better pieces because it's such a complicated topic that uh, that it just is. getting through it, you feel like you know you, you you deserve a medal. And you you are not scared of taking on complicated uh, subject matter. In researching this piece, I looked back to a piece you did for Green Building Advisor on the permeability of paints, which is also a pretty deep subject, right? Yes, 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 it was. Well, I enjoy I enjoy the learning process. I mean, it's one of the things that's kept me interested in the building business has been sort of getting deeper and deeper and learning more and more about it, you know, in, in every aspect that I possibly can. And that learning is what's interesting to me. So, so yes, although it's uh, sometimes a little bit gnarly, it's, uh, it, it's fun to penetrate something deeply and, and learn about it, you know, a little more than you did before you started. What are some of the other uh, pieces of uh, building content that you th- feel especially va- are valuable? Well, a lot of it, I, I mean, I think uh, the code study is important uh, because there's many aspects of the code, the building code, that are actually more permissive and open new, a- new, new um, uh, methods uh, for construction that a lot of times builders are unaware of. I mean, case in point, you have some articles I know published on frost-protected shallow foundations uh, the first time I heard about that, it just was confusing as heck because there's this calculation and this and that you have to do. But I studied it. I got into it. Uh, I, uh, I researched it. I read all about it. And, and I went into the ASTM manuals, et cetera. And now I, I'm using it all the time. I've probably built 30, 40 homes using frost-protected shallow foundations. And you can imagine the savings uh, in the area I'm building in right now. For example, in Omaha, I have a 42-inch frost depth. I'm putting down footings at about 14 inches. That's you know that's more than a, two feet of concrete all around the perimeter of the building that I'm that I'm saving on. There's many many other things. I mean, builders, for example, spend a lot of time cutting little fire blocks along their stair stringers. Well, you can use uh, fiberglass insulation, unbatted, un, unfaced fiberglass insulation. Stuff it along the along the uh, uh, the stringers, and you're done with your fire blocking. So there's many many things like that in the code that are of interest. Uh, I've gotten into a uh, wind, um, you know, how, how exterior products perform in the wind, uh, certainly earthquake, uh, shear panels, et cetera. So it, it, I think there's just a lot in terms of not just, not just uh, energy efficiency, which is the one thing that all the builders are into. Energy efficiency, I've got the best windows, I've got the best uh, uh, HVAC system, but structural elements, uh, you know, uh, durability, Thing, elements like the like the uh, article we just did on on uh, vapor control. Mm. So I just think there's everything. There's engineering. There's architecture. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty broad topic if you want to get into it that way. Hex, yeah, um, boy, we we spend hours talking about it every month, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> can you tell me how you became a builder, and did you have people in your life who introduced you to building and remodeling when you were little? Not at all. My my first uh, my teenage fantasy was to become a famous revolutionary like Che Guevara, not a home builder. <laughs> How'd that turn yeah. out? 
<laughs> we we immigrated to the U.S. where that competency has played. There's no hope of overthrowing the uh, the U.S. government, even though folks have tried even recently. That it's really kind of a, uh, a hopeless task. It's too powerful. But uh, but coming here uh, to the United States, you know, the first uh, teenage transformation was to become a hippie in my in my era. I yanked on my hair to try and get it long. I put on the dirtiest uh, bell bottoms I could I could find and rubbed them in the dirt and tried to you know fit in because I came here as kind of a weird kid. I was um, in Argentina. The style was this big collars with an ascot, short, tight hair, kind of like what I have it now, slicked back. Um, you know, baggy pants with button down flies. And you know, I came into a world I was very very different from the teenage world I entered in, in Buenos Aires uh, to New York. So I uh, became a hippie and eventually an art student. Uh, I can, you know, just fast forwarding. I went to school at, uh, I started my school actually in Queens College is where I got my, would be on my undergrad uh, work in New York, but eventually went to- What were you studying? I, 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 music. I was studying mm-hmm. music and fine art. I eventually went to CalArts in California. That's the school that Disney founded to- uh, Walt Disney to set up to train his Imagineers. His Imagineers were the folks that did all the creative work, and he set up an art school to train them. And I went to that school. There, uh, although I was not ever, you know, I was ne- never in the never in the direction of becoming a, a home builder. I was in the direction of becoming a, you know, not a revolutionary, a famous artist, something else. And I began to work in the theater shop as my work study. There, I had a you know, big shop, woodworking shop, and I learned to use all the tools, and we would build uh, sets, most often for the school, but sometimes also we would go out and build sets for small Hollywood features, uh, you know, uh, uh, student films and such, and I and learned a lot about building sets and how to make things look uh, to appear like something different than what they actually were. Uh, were you good at it? Time. I was very good at it. I got very good at it. And in fact, it's, it's, it's the only thing I derived from uh, from uh, college that is useful in my everyday uh, in my everyday work uh, is, is what I learned building building sets, how to make things appear. Because now what I do is I use that technique to make things appear much more expensive than they are. Mm-hmm. But that's how I got into home building. I started doing some some projects for teachers on the evenings and weekends. You know, getting a little bit of money and. Eventually, after I graduated, I played uh, clarinet and I tried to uh, do my career, but uh, kids were coming along and it was necessary to make a real living. And I went to work for an architect in that context, uh, began to uh, build homes and very, very quickly uh, kind of got into the home building and development business. Uh, actually, so I have to, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Were, were yeah. you drafting for the architect or you were managing projects for them? I was managing projects for the, uh, for the architects. Uh, later, I did uh, design, but uh, mainly I was managing projects. Mm. So that's uh, and we built uh, affordable housing, and and that's uh, one of my my talents was figuring out how to make things uh, you know look like they were high end, even though they weren't. Boy, that's a beautiful segue into our next question because you have written on the top deck of topic of affordable housing and remodeling for the Taunton Press. Can you tell me about those books, please? Sure, I. Um, well, how did I, why why did I publish the book? Where, first of all, I uh, I, I went into affordable home building because I was poor. Uh, you know, I was and my my mom brought me here, and we were she was a single mom, a school teacher, and I grew up in apartments in uh, bad neighborhoods in New York. So I understood a lot about the life of, uh, of single mothers and poor kids. I knew nothing about the life of uh, millionaires and billionaires. So. It was a natural for me, and because I didn't have a lot of money, the first projects I did, especially as a spec builder, were very low end. I had to buy cheap lots in the worst part of town and and build the least expensive house that I could. When I moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, I had never worked with um, Midwesterners, let alone with, uh, I had always been working within a minority uh, uh, segment, you know, within the Hispanic community. And so I had to kind of learn, well, what are these people like? You know, what, what are their architectural preferences? How do you design for them? And uh, began to look around for a model, how to build affordable housing without subsidy. You know, because every time I go to the lectures and stuff on how to build affordable housing, they were mostly accounting lectures, you know, how to uh, how to do the numbers, how to get fa- special subsidized fa- financing. And I was interested in how to do the nuts and bolts of it. So I... Um, I found a model in uh, some builders in Michigan uh, that were doing affordable housing, 
And they had done it by simply gathering together all the subs and uh, responding to a challenge from the uh, realtors of, of the uh, uh, of the town that they were building in. Um, what uh, you know? How how can we respond and create a ninety thousand dollar house? That was their goal at the time. And all the subs and a general contractor got together and they put together this home by collaboration that uh, that they were able to to build and and sell at that price. Was it a single family or was it multifamily for ninety k? No, it was a single family house. And wow. when, what happened was that they had the uh, the parade of homes and the newspaper said you can come and see the first one million dollar house up on the hill in this particular community, or you can see the ninety thousand dollar house at such and such an address. Well, the ninety thousand dollar house, there was a, a line around the block to get in, and uh, and these the, this builder and these subs realized that there was a really good. Uh, business uh, in in building these ninety thousand dollar homes. So I went and I, I learned. I interviewed uh, the fellow and uh, that uh, was a general contractor. And I took plans back with me to Lincoln, Nebraska, and I continued working with them. And then followed very much the same routine. Got all my subs together. Got my suppliers together. Just harnessed everybody's knowledge to get two things: one, their tips and tricks, which which were useful, and two, the buy-in because it's very hard to convince subs to do something cheaply. <laughs> Yeah, you know, they do the things the way they've always done them. Yes, 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 and 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 so w- by engaging them, um, I was able to uh, get them to uh, to to have buy in into the project and help me with it. Now, during, while all this was going on, I was writing for Fine Home Building, but I was always writing on really nice stuff, you know, because that's what you publish. You publish nice stuff, not cheap stuff. So I was writing about nice stuff, and it happened that uh, that was the nine eleven. Uh, happened. The towers came down and all the uh, airline flights were paralyzed. There was no, uh, you couldn't get in a plane. And so um, one of the uh, editors from Fine Home Building, uh, Tom O'Brien, he used to work at Fine Building, great guy. So he's a remodeling contractor now. And anyway, he had to drive across country to get back to, uh, to Taunton, to get back out to Connecticut. And he arrange stops along the way with writers that he was working with, one of whom was me. So he spent two days with me in Nebraska. And he asked me, what do you do? And I said, well, I do this cheap houses. I don't think you like them very well. It's not your thing. Oh, let me see what you do. And I began to show it to him. And at the time, I was building the houses and selling them for $75,000. Can you briefly describe what you were selling for seventy five grand? Because I think folks would find that remarkable. And we have to keep in mind it was 20 years ago now, but... It was 2000 and, uh, what was it, 2002. It, so 20 years. Yeah. It was a, um, well, I was building them for 35 uh, to $45 a square foot, and it was a 1,600 square foot, four bedroom, two bath. Uh, That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Well, today I build that for $95 a square foot, by the way, in an area where it's $150 a square foot to build an average house. So I've continued working on that. But the thing is that to achieve that, it isn't any one thing. It isn't. You can do it. You can get free land and not achieve it. Uh, you can get the, the 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 best rate of financing and not achieve it. It's actually a very a very studied. It's a very um, uh, detailed, uh, painstaking, uh, difficult process. It, it has many 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 elements in order to reduce cost. Because if you think of a you know, a typical house is a thousand, fifteen hundred uh, line items, and there is no line item that's sufficiently large uh, to really make an impact on the cost of the construction. Of course, the land is one, but yeah, you know, the land is relative to the real estate area you're in, and of course, the the, the cost of the house is relative to that area too. So, the um, it, it required a kind of thinking and a and, and a way of approaching the design and the construction that intrigued this fine home building editor, and with some difficulty convinced um, Tom Tim to uh, fine home building magazine to publish an article about my house. I published the article, and it turned out to be enormously popular. It Go figure! Popular. People looking for affordable housing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was odd because it, you know, it, it's in a high-end uh, craft magazine, and there was, yeah. and the house was not beautiful. I mean, it's won no awards, but it's my masterpiece, if you will. Uh, so um, uh, the, 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 the article was published. It was so popular, there was such a strong reaction to it among readers that uh, the Taunton Press, the, the the book writing wing, contacted me and said, "How'd you like to do a book?" And I said, "I'd, I'd love to do a book." 
but I don't want to do a book on my houses in Lincoln, Nebraska. That's pretty limited. You know, I, I want to do something broader about building affordable homes in general. And at the time, uh, book writers got a, um, uh, you know, a travel budget and all of that. And I traveled all the markets. I spent almost two years on the book, traveling every major market in the United States, interviewing the best affordable home builders in, in all the major markets and gathering a lot of information and tips and tricks and things that would apply in Florida, in Los Angeles, in Chicago, in Connecticut. You know, there was enough information that anybody could pick up the book and, and get valuable, not only general information about how to think about and how to approach affordable home building, but actually nuts and bolts information on how to do it. I used to build in California where building is completely different than everywhere else in the country. And I would pick up the magazines and I'd find something very exciting in it, but I couldn't do it. So I wanted anybody to be able to pick up the book that I'd written and find valuable, actionable information in it. And that's how I ended up. Right Then I wrote a book about uh, the remodeling because the first book, the affordable uh, building an affordable house is the name of the book. It, it was very, very popular. It, it, um, it, it was even it was a uh, Home Depot was selling the book. So it was, it was quite a successful book. The second one was on remodeling, and that's where I really exploited all the stuff I learned at CalArts on how to make, uh, you know, how to make things appear grand uh, that really uh, aren't. And and that was a fun book uh, for me because of that sleight of, sleight of hand. So many builders say you can't make any money building affordable housing. What are they getting wrong? What, or is it just is it difficult? Or is it impossible in some places? It's difficult. Uh, it's n it's not impossible anywhere. Uh, one of the uh, uh, people I interviewed in the book was a fellow out in San Francisco who, at the time, was building houses for one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars in San Francisco. Now, it, of course, that would be impossible today. But in his day, the cheapest house in San Francisco was four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So you can you can see the difference. Mm -hmm. This was uh, the um, architect uh, Donald McDonald. He wrote a book called Democratic Architecture, which is kind of a manifesto of affordable housing. The thing is that you have to really want to build affordable housing. That has to be your, your, your objective. And usually builders have a different objective. And then they, they kind of want to do a few things to you know, cut corners or to make it a little bit less expensive, or they want the subs to give them better bids or something like that. And no one of those things works. It's just quite difficult because you have to approach every single element from from, from how you dig the foundation to to what kind of concrete you use to to you know the type of foundation that you that you install uh, through the framing through everything you know? and uh, it's just um, it, it's just a, a, a something that most people don't have the patience for. I, I spend a year on a set of plans before I start building it, and then of course I build that same set of plans again and again and again. Yeah, you're not going to invest all that much time and do it once. It's not worth it. Right. So if you want to do it once, it's not worth trying. Uh, and if you want to create a set of plans that you can build affordably, you're just going to have to do a lot of work to get it there. Change it. Keep going back to it, editing it, editing it, editing it, like you would if you were writing a novel. Or a magazine article. Or a magazine article. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, um, do you think we're doing a good job building houses in this country? Do you like what you see when you drive around and see other new homes under construction, multi or single family? Well, I'm surprised you asked me that question because you know the answer. You know the answer because I submitted an article about my opinion of what builders are building nowadays, and, and you didn't like it. You decided not to publish it because you thought uh, it might hurt some of the reader's feelings. So I'm, so I'm a little bit surprised. Hey, but you asked. I, I want to hear it. And I, I I, I've said it on the show, but, too, that I don't think we're doing a very good job. Well, I, I, I tell you what, uh, we may be doing a very good job, and certain builders are certainly doing a very good job, typically on things like energy or craft. I mean, there's some people, you know, just look at this fine door, the way I installed it, the tolerances are perfect, the beautiful mortising on Okay. Um, I, I just think you missed the bigger picture with that, uh, which is the, the architecture. Uh, it mm. used to be, and I'm talking about like in the, you know, the 17, 1800s, the builders read books written by architects like the Country Builders Companion, you know, books like that. Uh, the American Vignola. How many builders know the name Vignola? They don't. Uh, Vignola was an architect that brought back kind of the classical um, 
uh, architecture of the uh, you know of the Greek and Roman uh, classical periods. Uh, it was a it, it, this was this this occurred in, in, in Italy and then it went on to uh, um, England and, and, and the British uh, picked up this uh, kind of uh, classical building traditions and then created their own type of architecture based on the classical proportions and uh, symmetry. And there was kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a real builders really understood these things. They knew how to create an opening, an entry. They, they, they knew how to proportion windows. They knew, you know, where to place things in the building, and they understood what they were referring to. They didn't like like a smorgasbord of, of or, or a buffet of styles on the single house. You know, seven gables, twenty different building materials, etc. Now we build through exaggeration. We think we've got something really special. If we've got like all kinds, of, you know, we got I got brick, I got stone, I got stucco, I got siding, I got everything on. No, that's a showroom of <laughs> building materials. It's not. It's not a style of home. Look at the old houses. Go visit the old part of town. The stuff built before the 1940s. It's all beautiful, and a lot of it wasn't designed by an architect. It was just built by a home builder. But that home builder had read a little bit about architecture, understood a little bit about architecture, had an eye for architecture. And I think that is missing. I think it's, it's uh, builders are so focused on the technical aspects of construction and nowadays on the, uh, on the energy efficiency and to some degree on the green, all of which is good. You have to be technically proficient. Uh, you want to be a responsible person in, in our society. Whatever you're doing, do it in a way that's responsible and climate change and all that's important. But it isn't the only thing. And in fact, I don't even think it's the main thing. I think the main thing is the architecture. Build beautiful homes and they will be durable because people will sustain Take care of them. them. They yeah. them. I have built little neighborhoods that were like little gems in slums. Slums. I've gone back years later. In fact, when I wrote the book that we were just talking about, the affordable housing book, I went back to projects that had been 10 years before in, in, in bad neighborhoods and thought, my God, this, they might, I won't be able to take any pictures to show off the great stuff I did because it'll be destroyed by now. It'd be driving into the neighborhood mattresses on the side of the road, derelict half crumbling homes. And then I'd pop into my little neighborhood and it was perfectly preserved <laughs> as if it had been, you know, it was, it was in a little, one of those little uh, uh, snow globes. Uh, and uh, the trees had grown in, the landscaping was there, people were mowing the lawn. And, and in fact, the same people I sold to were still there and they greeted me. They didn't tell me about all their problems in the house. They were really happy because the neighborhood, they, they loved it and they maintained it. So beauty is actually a sustainable element in, in, in architecture and housing. And I respect architects because of the study they've done. I know from my art background, what it means to really train your eye. You know, it's like being a sommelier of wine. You don't just pick up, the, I mean, you close your eyes, what can you tell about wine? Most people can tell that it's, maybe that it's wine and not beer. <laughs> That's about, it. with your eyes open, you know if it's white wine or red wine, right? But to taste the hints of, uh, of apricot and all of that, no, you don't. But you know what? The people that are experts at it, the sommeliers, they do perceive all of that. They understand if it's a Bordeaux or if it's a, you know, well, I could tell the difference between a Bordeaux and a Riesling too, but, you know, it, it, there's, there's a training, an aesthetic training. So I go, I go by a neighborhood and I can tell you what house was designed by an architect and I can tell you what house was designed by a builder and even worse, what house was designed by a builder with the homeowner's input, you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, I, I have a funny how, story. So, I, I was, I was very... touring one time. I was touring one time with an architect, and he took me to show me one of the homes he had designed. And I knew exactly what points the uh, the homeowner had had twisted his arm. And I kept <laughs> pointing to those things. We were, we were touring with the homeowner and the architect. I kept pointing to those things and saying, "Oh, that's extraordinary the way you did the steps there by the." And the home and the homeowner was like, "Oh yes." That, mm, yeah. that is, <laughs> after which I laughed my head off because the, the architect was hating me the whole time. Everything he hated about the house i was i was and i knew what had happened you know so when you study, so fundamentally how do you how do you rein in a, a homeowner who who wants ugly stuff I, you know i would think most builders would say that that's not their job they're trying to make a living but do you feel like they a builder has an obligation to keep people on the right track i do i do because it's not just their living it's my eyesore 
you know, they made some money on it. And then I had to drive by it every day and take a look at it. And it ruins my world. It ruins my neighborhood. It makes us, um, it makes a, a neighborhood that I don't really even care to walk around in. You know, you got to drive somewhere else to walk around because it's not all that appealing. So I think it's important just simply because it's, it's in the public realm. So it's, you have a certain responsibility to the, you know, to the world you live in. Uh, so I, I do think it's important. And how do I do it? It's very easy. I don't allow it, <laughs> at least on the exterior. I don't allow. I, I control it. And if the and folks don't like it, I move on. I presume you have to say that right up front, right? You have to say, look, if you're going to work with me, you know, uh, there are going to be some things I can't compromise on. Are you okay with that? Is that part of the early discussions with a potential client? I, I don't ask if they're okay with it. I just let them know that's how it is. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, well, some people don't like that, and I understand. I'm cool with it. But uh, but I don't, you know, I, I don't, I guess I don't need to, you know, to, to just, just to make a living to, to do that, and I, I don't like to anymore. Uh, now, of course, you, you have to compromise to some extent. For example, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of garages, but most subdivision, the lots, you have no option but to put the garage in front of the house. I'm certainly not going to ask somebody to live without a garage. And so, you know, there are certain compromises that I make on a daily basis, don't like to make, but I do, unless I'm doing my own development, in which case I also design it in such a way that I can present the best face to the street. Do you, uh, have you ever had a bad feeling about a, a project and, uh, how did it turn out? Um, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, my, uh, the, the projects that have not turned out well, are the projects that have been done in a hurry mm-hmm. because there hasn't been proper planning, proper thought, and generally they don't work out, uh, for one of two reasons, uh, either financial because they just the cost came in too high because you didn't spend enough time figuring out what the costs were going to be and if it was viable people start thinking oh it'd be great if we had this and it'd be great if we had that and, we, and then it turns out that all of this and that has a cost that uh, you know you're always limited in cost i always think of it like writing a sonnet you know sonnet is a very strict form of poetry you have 14 um uh, lines you have so many syllables you have to there's a lot of restrictions to it and so I think in terms of construction, it's having many restrictions, one of which is, of course, the value, the market value of what you're building. So projects don't turn out well when you don't plan them. You don't spend enough time in planning. You want to get to the building quickly. You get the plans drawn out. Let's get this going. we got to get this going. And then it, then it goes bad. So speed in the planning stage uh, can result in a lot of extra time in construction and a lot of extra cost. The other part of it is, of course, uh, the compatibility that you have with your client. If you're working with people you don't like or you can't get along with or that are difficult to get along with, the project will be a disaster. People people have an expectation that their house is going to be like a brand new car. And it's not. Why? Because a brand new car has gone through many phases of planning. It has gone through uh, uh, a, a kind of a rigorous a prototyping. Um, it, it's not a handmade first run product. Right. Like most of the time building is. So the expectations that people have from the menu that's been, been, you know, the manufactured world. So if I see a tiny little scratch on my, on something new I'm buying, then I want a discount or I want the other one that doesn't have the scratch. Uh, so that's a level of sensitivity that's very hard to satisfy. And if the client does not understand that, you're in for trouble. You're going to spend more money on warranties and fixing things and then try, making that client happy is going to be the, the, the dilemma. And, and, and the, it's going to turn into that. How do I make this guy happy rather than how do I build a really beautiful home with well, the best craftsmanship available? A lot of uh, tradespeople have health problems related to their work. You've had a varied career. Um, so do you have problems with, uh, hearing or your back or your shoulders or your elbow or hands or all the other things that people who work with their hands their whole lives have? Well, one of the things I'm very happy with, and I'll, I'll prove it here, I have all 10 fingers. <laughs> that's <laughs> not a given, right? Guy. Yes, that's <laughs> not a given. I've met many a guy without the whole 10 fingers. So that's one thing when I began doing carpentry work that I, I hoped I would have all 10 fingers, but by my age, 
and I do, so I'm very happy about that. However, I, I did do stupid stuff that I certainly wouldn't do again, but I see young people doing it all the time, which is things like I was working without, um, without any kind of a, a protection, you know, a mask or a respirator, or even a dust mask on. And, you know, it bothered me to have it on, and uh, I don't know, I'm tough, and I would work with all kinds of chemicals that were fairly, uh, you know, harsh, Especially when I started, there wasn't uh, the, the level of control that there is today about the process of these chemicals. So we, we work with things, with paints and such, and we're pretty, um, pretty, bad, you know, hard on the on, on the lungs and your blood and your health. I I removed asbestos without any kind of uh, protection. So I, I I breathed in a lot of dust. I breathed in a lot of chemicals. And uh, my lungs, if you look at them under a um, you know, just a scan or whatever it is that they take pictures of your lungs, my lungs are scarred up as if I was a heavy smoker. So I have the lungs of a smoker, but I've never smoked. I don't even never smoke. I don't even smoke pot. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't smoke, but my lungs are damaged as if I had uh, smoked for many many years. I I really regret that. I um, I wish I hadn't been so stupid as a young man. Other than that, I've had my share of cuts and bruises and things like that, but nothing that has been, uh, you know, crippling or lifelong except for that. Breathing in a lot. And I see that today. I see the guys cutting, uh, you know, fiber cement. Concrete with, concrete, you know, sawing in concrete. highway work. And they have maybe a bandana on, right? It's just crazy. Uh, bandana. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, so, and what do you, I, I tell them, but. They're like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we have to create. I think you'd agree. We have to create a culture that makes it. You know, there's just no discussion about it. You wear the gear so you can have a long uh, career and and not have health problems later. So you can enjoy your grandkids and and not have to be taken care of by your children. You know. Well, if you had told me that you, I was doing this to enjoy my grandchildren at the time when youth was everything, I would have been very insulted. <laughs> you said no <laughs> way. Get that old. <laughs> I don't think so. I think you have to you have to create a new human being that can uh, think in terms of the, uh, uh, you know project a little bit into the future. Why do why why do young people not save money? Uh, why don't you know? Why do we make so many mistakes? Basically, because we're living in the moment. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're not, uh, you know, we, we prefer not to have the bother of the mask you know, rather than thinking in terms of what am I going to, what's my health going to be like when, you know, 30 years from now. So we want we to hear the super loud music. We're not thinking in terms of what's our, you know, what, what our ears are going to be doing in the future. And I'm going to be hard of hearing and I'm going to be asking you to repeat yourself all the time. It's so annoying, you know, with older people. Well, I can tell you a lot of the people with these earbuds on all the time and a lot of music. Well, they're going to be old folks that you're going to have to scream at them to get Yeah, to I'm sure you're right. I'm sure you're so, right, and it's you know, really pervasive now. Yeah, it is. It is, and, and the sounds, man. You don't, you know, how many how many builders are wearing earmuffs on the job with all those saws and high pitch stuff and all that going on? It's it's oh, for yeah. me. It's rare to see, right? It's it's the exception, not the rule. Very rare. Yeah. So this is my favorite part of the show. Can you tell me about your own house? Do you have any problems building science or architectural that uh, you want to fess up to? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll answer that question in two parts. First, my house in the sense of I you know, moved from, I, I built my very first house. Uh, it was an A-frame um, and I, I built it all with my hand. Every, every nail driven in that house was driven by my my hand, my, my sound, my with my sore elbow, I did get an elbow, mm-hmm. uh, because of all the hammering. But I, I built my very first house. I built many houses, and you know, after a while, of course, I wasn't doing all that much of the construction, and eventually, I was doing none of the construction at all. But the the masterpiece house I built, I um, I built, and uh, it was on HGTV. Yeah, it was. A I didn't know that. House. Yeah, I said that my house is on HGTV. It's a beautiful house. The only problem with it was the mortgage. It's a little high. Uh, but uh, the house was perfect. In fact, when I sold the house, which I eventually did, and I sold the house in 2008 um, during the Great Recession, I sold it. At, and I didn't even sell it at a loss because I had built it very, uh, although it was, a, it was a very high end house, a $750,000 house, which is high end in, you know, in the Midwest. But uh, it, um, um, I, I built it very affordably. So even in the middle of the recession, I was actually able to clear a little bit of money. 
like 50 grand. But um, uh, w w when the inspector came, you know, the guy who looks to see if there's any uh, defects in the house that have to be corrected before the sale is consummated, he found none. And, he, and the, the realtor for the other side called me and said, you know, my inspector said he'd never had that experience of finding a house where there was no defects. He couldn't find anything wrong with the house. So that was um, my home. However, this is the second part of the question I'm going to answer. After that house, because this was sold in the Great Recession, and uh, my, my business uh, went under in the Great Recession. If you recall, that Great Recession started instead of the way most recessions start, which is at the high end, that recession started at the low end. It was the, all, all the affordable home builders went out of business, including me at the time. I'm back in business. I, I recovered, but at the time, it was pretty difficult. That was devastating for a lot of people, man. I lost my job in that period too. It was, it was terrible. It was terrible. It was the worst time of my life for sure. Most yeah. horrible time. But I moved into one of my affordable homes. I moved into the one of the houses that I built for poor people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't that, it wasn't a, like a, a poverty house, but it was a nice house, but it was my, one of my houses that I built using all the techniques in my book in order to make it as affordable as possible. And I discovered that some of those techniques can be a little bit annoying when you're actually living in the house. <laughs> like what? <laughs> like, for example, I would never use a three-way switch. I would locate a switch, right, in kind of in a midpoint in a hallway between the bedrooms. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> and I hated that too. I hated it. Every time I was in the dark, feeling the And you the say wall, to yourself, like, that would cost $15 to put in, that two, you know, two switches, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so there was many little elements like that in the house that I found really annoying. And I said, my God, anybody who does this needs to live in one of their homes <laughs> so you can see what you're doing to people. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> so What uh, else? So, so yes, I, I, did, uh, I, I, did, uh, I did discover uh, some, some defects. For example... Uh, I noticed one day that my guys were framing the house very, very quickly because we really streamlined everything. I had prefabricated walls. Man, this thing was going up quickly. And then I went back to the job and they were still framing. And then I went back to the job and they were still framing. And I said, well, you know, we got so far so fast. They seem to have stalled. What's happening? Well, what was happening was that they were working on the eaves all around the house, you know, the, the soft mm -hmm. foundation all, the, all around the house. And man, that was taking a long time. Yeah. So I said, well, screw that. I kept the eave on the front gable and eliminated every other eave. I just cut it out and I created this kind of um, this uh, detail that's in my book about, you know, with flashing and stuff to kind of protect that edge. It didn't work as well as I hoped. And I ended up with a lot of warranty calls of water and stuff getting in. And I realized the importance of eaves in terms of shedding water away from the exterior walls. Even like you know, badly detailed stucco homes that have good overhangs do pretty well. It is hugely important to building durability. And it's you were talking about what builders in past eras knew. That's definitely one of the things they seem to pay attention to. Sometimes you need to eliminate something in order to appreciate. You know, you don't know what you got till it's gone. Amen. <laughs> I learned the value of eaves. And, and like that, I have many, many stories. Now, I'll tell you how I tracked it, though, what I did. I had a, uh, or had uh, a, um, an accounting method where every time I got a warranty call, all the costs related to that warranty were saved into a separate job called warranty. In my, my accounting was a job I'd open at the beginning of the year, warranty, it'd have zero budget and it'd have no cost associated with it until I got my first warranty call. Let's say that first warranty call was caused by a leaky window because I'd put in inexpensive windows and so this window leaked, okay? What happened when it leaked? Well, there was damage to drywall, there was damage to carpeting, there was damage to painting that was required. There was a, all those things, painting, carpet, drywall, everything related to that leak went under windows. If I had a roofing issue that caused a warrant, everything related to that, even if it was buying a new couch that got wet when the roof leaked, went under roofing. And then Towards the end of the year, six months on, I would begin to say, well, where are my warranty costs coming from? One thing I discovered was a lot of them were coming from windows. And I upgraded my windows. Now, why? It was not that the, win the, the window itself was bad. It's just that the window was not forgiving. The installation had to be perfect for the window to 
perform as designed. So every time I complain to the window company, look, your lousy window, it leaked. No, sir, it's not my lousy window. It's your lousy installation. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, I've got to install the windows with framers and stuff, not with not with surgeons. And, and so, you know, I needed a window that would handle <laughs> the framers. Mm-hmm. So this is the kind of thing that I went learning. And of course, it's important because that's also the way you go reducing your warranty costs, which are part of your building costs. Part of the affordability equation is to build good enough that you don't have a warranty claim. It has been a pleasure talking to you. I could talk to you for hours, but uh, we're, we're really running out of time. Anything you want to ask or tell our listeners before we get part company? Nope, but I would have loved to have talked about my, uh, my experience building in Latin America, particularly in Ecuador, uh, where I got to experience the, uh, the uh, forest to frame, uh, if you will. You know, um, they talk about um, farm to table. And the idea of being actually connected with the source, the natural source of those things that we consume. Well, in Ecuador, working in the rainforest and working with uh, local craftsmen that were the same guys that would harvest the materials that we used, it put me in touch with that same equation with regards to our homes, you know, particularly they're built out of wood. Um, you know, the, the connection with the, with the natural environment that brings these things to life. And then we use them to consume in our home, in our food, to consume in our homes. And that connection to me has become very, very important appreciation of the forest as something I've experienced and lived with and, and smelled, touched, uh, watched as the trees were being cut down. That was, that's something I really, I really have a, um, kind of as a poetic and passionate part of my life. Do you think that the builders in Ecuador would be surprised at how we build houses in the United States? You know, it depends on the builders. There's, uh, I would say there's two parts. There's the rural builders that do build a lot of wood, cane, things like that. Um, of course, they would be surprised because, you know, maybe they have like one pipe in the house and here we have a whole plumbing system. Uh, they would be surprised by the codes and the professionalism and things like electrical work that don't exist there. You know, I had a, an electrical uh, shower uh, head <laughs> that exploded one day. My wife was screaming, "My God, what happened? The shower head exploded!" It was okay. It was electrical. It heated the heating element was in the shower head itself. But that's uh, crazy so, to me. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I've been in uh, in a bathroom where I'm in the tub, and there's a plug there. You know, in case you wanted to listen to the radio. I guess I don't know. But uh, so you can shave uh, so right while you're in the tub. <laughs> now, now, there's a lot of that, of course, uh, and that's and that's true throughout a lot of the world. But I think what you're getting at is something different, which is here we build out of wood, um, as, as sticks, as all, little sticks. sticks. Yeah, sticks, little sticks, and. People that are used to living in concrete homes, concrete masonry homes, do find it very odd that, uh, for example, if you're building out of concrete, you can get extremely tight tolerances on things like doors. You know, you can get a door that's like an airplane door. It just fits in perfect. You don't need, you don't need a lot of slop. You don't need a lot of slop for expansion and contraction and all of that. You have a steel door that maybe looks like wood, but it's a... Uh, um, but that's very common and, and, and everything else is concrete and it doesn't move. You walk across the floor and it doesn't squeak. You can sneak back into the house late at night and not wake your wife up because the floors aren't squeaking. And, and yes, when I have my family come from, uh, from Argentina and visit uh, one of, uh, you know, where I'm living and they walk across the second floor and it's squeaking and stuff, they're like, I'm oh, freaked out. Is the house going to fall? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's what you were referring to, and yes. Fernando, it has been a pleasure talking to you. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you, too. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Fernando for joining us, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us our comment, your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Thanks for listening, everyone. Stay safe. Happy building. Keep craft alive. I hope you'll be on again, Fernando. This has been a pleasure. Love you.